and the mother of all talk shows. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. In the early hours of this morning, I thought I'd be addressing you on the eve of World War III, a war which would bring about the end of life on this planet. But that's because I briefly made the mistake of believing the mainstream media in full screeching, hoarse, ferocious and ugly harmony that Russia had attacked Poland with missiles. Poland, being a member of NATO, had triggered Article 5 of the NATO Constitution and that therefore a state of war existed between NATO and the Russian Federation. Of course, we now know that it was all a lie or a terrible mistake. You choose, you decide. Every single organ of the British media salivating, dripping with the saliva and blood of war was roaring for a unleashing of those dogs of war and crying havoc. And it was frightening at two o'clock in the morning at least. By five o'clock in the morning, it became clear any fool knoweth that the trajectory of the rocket the casing that was photographed on the ground in the unfortunate farmstead on the border between Poland and Ukraine could not possibly have been a Russian missile. Russian territory is a thousand kilometers away. The range of the missile that we were looking at on our screens was 160 kilometers. Moreover, it had Ukrainian markings on it. Now, the Pentagon, the Polish government, and every other government in the world is openly stating it was a Ukrainian missile. But Zelensky, the provocateur, continues to insist that it was a Russian missile attack on Poland. The man is an inveterate liar, a hoaxer, a comedian, and yet you are still giving him billions of your taxpayers' dollars, speaking of which, the FPX Ponzi scheme which collapsed this week cost five million people ten billion dollars. But the Democrats and Joe Biden are laughing all the way to the bank because before the Ponzi scheme collapsed, its owner gave north of 40 million dollars in donations in just six months to Joe Biden's Democrats for the midterm elections. Moreover, he pledged $1 billion for the re-election fund of Joe Biden in 2024. Speaking of which, Donald Trump is off and running. I told you he would be. He took his club, I don't know if he paid the commercial rate for the hire, at Mar-a-Lago in Florida to announce this week that he is a candidate for the presidency of the United States of America. His liberal, progressive, and democratic opponents affect to be amused, but in fact, they now walk in dread because they can't be sure. Despite their soft power in big tech and in the mass media, that they will be able to defeat him again. We'll be talking about all of these things and more over the next two hours. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night because this is the mother of all talk shows. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway, the mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom, and you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. This midweek moats extra, uh, you might call it, is only possible uh, by the generosity of our sponsors. My good friend Ravi sponsors the first hour, 220 KM Inc. His uh, cosmetics are responsible 
for the fact that I'm looking 20 minutes younger, uh, or maybe even younger than that. It is fantastic. I'm lathered in it every single night. So pure and nutritious is it that you can eat it. And now you can eat it in the European Union, in the United States, in Canada, and you can do it shipment free. If you buy two products from their website, they'll ship these products free. Trust me, I wouldn't say this for any sponsor, but I'm saying it for 220KM Inc. Their products really work. If you think I'm looking good, you should see my missus. Now, as I said in my opening remarks, it seemed pretty dreadful in the middle of the night. As uh, followers of my Twitter feed know, I don't sleep all that much. It's one of the few benefits of getting older. And so in real time, I was following the shenanigans in Bali as one summit after another was called and then reported by every news outlet in the world. Hungary was meeting Poland, Poland was meeting someone else, the United States was briefing this country and that country. And the media chorus, in all its ugliness and unanimity, was declaring that Russia had attacked Poland and that Article 5 would be triggered and a state of war between the nuclear armed superpowers, the United States and America, and the Russian Federation would very imminently exist. I don't make any uh, apology for saying this to you, because you need to know it. Despite the health official who told the US Congress this week that a nuclear explosion in the continent of Europe would have no direct bearing on health in the United States of America. That was, of course, a lie, unless you were never going to eat or drink anything that came from the European Union again. But in any case, shows the insouciance with which the political class in the United States, the equanimity with which they view the possibility of nuclear war in Europe. But he might be right in the sense that it is perfectly possible that this would not become an intercontinental war, though you'd be a fool to bet your house on it. But it would very definitely become a short and then intermediary range nuclear exchange of weapons. That means that every city in which most of you are watching me would cease to exist and every person, dog and cat within it would cease to exist. We would be a heap of smoking ash, though no one would be there. To photograph it. Every single human being in Europe would be wiped out. If the weapons started to fly, they would not stop flying. Think 1914. Think the assassination of the Archduke Ferdinand, of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, now not even a footnote in history. And yet all of us are still feeling the effects of the First World War that was triggered by that assassination. No one now, or even within 12 months in the blood and gore of the trenches, could possibly agree that the killing of the Archduke Ferdinand was worth all of this. Well, that would have been the case. I can't pronounce the name of the tiny village on the Polish-Ukrainian frontier, on which this missile fell, and neither can you. I certainly couldn't find it on the map. But my children would be required to die for it if Article 5 had been triggered. On what would, if anyone was left to write the history, have been known forever after as an entirely fake, bogus prospectus. There was no Russian attack on Poland. Although if there had been, I'd be saying to you now, why shouldn't Russia attack Poland? After all, Poland is attacking Russia. Poland has placed a state of economic siege against Russia. There are thousands of Polish fighters fighting Russians inside the Ukraine. If you don't believe me, look at the death notices in the Polish press. Look at the pictures of the passports taken from the corpses of Polish fighters on the Ukrainian battlefield. Polish weapons are openly being 
shunted across the frontier between the two countries to fight Russians. So I'm not sure why they were all clutching their pearls like maiden ants at the possibility that Russia might have hit them back, but of course it didn't. It wouldn't, because Russia is a far more responsible party to this conflict than any of the other parties involved. The Russians would not attack Poland because they don't want World War III. Poland is attacking Russia because it doesn't mind, for some unfathomable reason, the consumption of the entire European continent in nuclear warfare. For those who say I'm being alarmist and that a NATO-Russia war would not necessarily turn nuclear, you know nothing about military affairs if that's what you think. If Russia was winning such a conventional war, NATO would have to use nuclear weapons to stop Russia from winning. After all, if they didn't, there might not be a Poland. There might not be a Germany. The Russians might keep on rolling their tanks all the way to Berlin, as they did rather successfully, thank God, once before. On the other hand, if NATO were winning the conventional NATO-Russia war, Russia would have to use its nuclear weapons. Of course it would. What would it? Sacrifice all of its territory? Unlike Napoleon, unlike Hitler, allow Joe Biden to conquer St. Petersburg and Moscow and take Russia and all its treasures and divide it up amongst their corporate friends, destroy the Russian Federation, balkanize it, break it into pieces, Seriously, you think Putin or Medvedev or anyone that came after them would allow such a thing? Of course not. So any war between NATO and Russia must ineluctably become an exchange of nuclear weapons, first on the battlefield and then by steady process of escalation into intermediate range, which means Berlin. Paris, London, Birmingham, Glasgow, Aberdeen. It means the end, mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters. It means the end, capital E-N-D. Wake up, for God's sake. Because it wasn't just the media in the early hours of this morning. On your newsstands right now are a shoal of newspapers with a lying front page splash that Russia had attacked Poland and that a state of war may soon exist between us and Russia. They're all there. Go to the supermarket after this show and you'll see them there. Never was a show of front pages so quickly made redundant. But it wasn't just the media. Social media was awash with people who are not of an age that they themselves would have to fight, sometimes would not be able to fight. Oftentimes wouldn't be able to fight their way out of a wet paper bag with no tin hat, with no rifle, and no knapsack, and no intention of going to fight Russia, but determined, savagely, savagely raving for other people's sons and daughters to go and fight Russia. What's wrong with you? What is wrong with the public, especially in Britain, which is worse than any country in Europe and worse than any part of the United States in its raving for war, in its savage longing for a war with Russia? That's a question all of us in this island have to pay closer attention to. If you don't believe me, go through the timelines of some of those who were calling for blood in the early hours of this morning. There are five million people calling for the blood of the owners of FPX, a Ponzi scheme which falsely portrayed itself as a cryptocurrency outfit. In fact, 
all it issued was IOUs for cryptocurrency. The collapse of FPX does not invalidate the case for Bitcoin and cryptocurrency invalidates the existence of Ponzi schemes. Uh, just like Madoff's Ponzi scheme. Just like the banks, all of them, and their Ponzi scheme. Because what Bankman Fried did is exactly what your bank is doing. It is taking your money and lending it to someone else five, 10, 20, 50 times and earning interest from everyone that they lent your money to. If you all asked for your money back at the same time, it would collapse just like Bankman Fried destroyed FBX because that's all that happened. One of the biggest holders of his IOUs started dumping them, selling them because they knew something that the rest of us didn't know. They knew that this guy and his Ponzi scheme were not much longer for this world. And the more they dumped, the faster the price fell, the more people asked for their money back. And hey presto, Bankman Fried skedaddled to the Bahamas where he's currently shanghaied, presumably as a precursor of deportation back to the United States, where most of the five million losers happen to live. So much so made off. He made off with it billions, perhaps ten billion dollars lost. But this one is much more important than that. First of all, because as I said at the beginning, this man, Bankman Fried, is the US Democratic Party's second biggest donor. After that other great paragon of virtue, George Soros, who is their number one donor. The number two donor was FPX. The victories such as they were that they scored in the elections in America last week were paid for by an outfit that has now collapsed, having robbed $10 billion from 5 million people. Are the Democrats going to give it back? Is Joe Biden going to send out checks to the tune of 40 million as partial compensation to all of those who've lost their money in the collapse of FPX? Surely, that would be the honorable thing to do, wouldn't it? But it gets much worse. Because it now turns out that there was a circle involved. You might say one of the innermost circles of hell. Here's how it looked. The Democrats gave billions of tens of billions of dollars to Ukraine. Ukraine bought millions of dollars from FPX. And FPX gave millions of dollars to Joe Biden. How's that for a loop-de-loop? -loop? How's that for a Ponzi scheme? You, the American taxpayer, gave money to the Ukrainian government that sent some of it back to FPX. Who sent some of that back to Joe Biden and the Democrats? Now, far be it from me to tell the Republican Party that now controls the House of Representatives how they should conduct their business. But if they don't set up the most powerful inquiry into this apparent corruption bigger than any corruption story ever in history, then they're fools as well as knaves. This FPX scandal might bring down two presidents, Joe Biden and Zelensky. The Grey Zone, the peerless investigative journalist outfit operating out of the United States, and its journalist Kit Clarenberg operating out of London, have just published a breakdown of this scandal that I could not possibly match. But you must read it. 
And when you read it, you'll realize that this could be the end, not just for the politicians involved, but for the whole project of shipping almost breathtaking sums of money from the suffering U.S. taxpayers directly into the coffers of the Ukrainian regime. Glenn Greenwald, the brilliant journalist operating out of Brazil, published this earlier today. This is the U.S. funding for the war in Ukraine in the last nine months. Never mind all that went before. In the last nine months. In March, the U.S. gave Ukraine $13.6 billion. In May, just two months later, the U.S. taxpayer gave Ukraine $40 billion. And in November, Biden has now asked for another $37.7 billion for Ukraine. That totals $91.3 billion, which is 33% more than Russia's entire defense budget and double the U.S. average annual spend during its own war in Afghanistan. You need to ask yourself just what it was about the Ukrainian conflict that first attracted Biden his family, his party, to such deep involvement in the Ukrainian war. And maybe this FPX scandal will give some of the answers. Is this just a giant money laundering expedition where the military industrial complex have US taxpayers' dollars poured down their throats so fast they can't even swallow it? And that the Ukraine benefits from the weapons made by the U.S. military industrial complex and they kick back the hard currency to the United States and into the coffers of the U.S. Democratic Party so that it can continue in political office, so that it can continue funding the whole shebang. Will that all come to an end very quickly in just two years from now. Donald Trump has announced he's off and running. It will be a brave Republican that will stand against him, though the media, which hates him, is doing its best to nonetheless encourage him, Ron DeSantis, to stand against Trump. My guess is that DeSantis will not run against Trump, but he may. And we're asking in our poll this evening, who will be the Republican nominee in 2024? Donald Trump's ahead on Twitter, 58 to 42 over Ron DeSantis. On YouTube, he's ahead 70 over 30. And on Telegram, he's ahead 67 over 33. That, I think, is roughly accurate. But we'll be talking to two American guests in the course of the show and we'll get their take on it. Anyway, I told you, it's going to be a bumpy night. Fasten your seatbelts right after this very, very short break. I'll be talking to the one and only Ben Swan. Stay tuned. Hello, America. It is me, Joe Biden. I think I'm not re 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 reading a tele 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 prompter. I'm perfectly robust, capable of speaking for myself. 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 The giant Labour Party sailing clearance is now on. Hurry now, as we've got zero interest in our party. It's literally the lowest it's ever been. Give up on the common man and save today. That's right, we're getting rid of all of the Corbynites. Literally every single one. Being a Blairite has never been more in style. 
only available at what should be the UK's biggest political party. The new new Labour Party. We're doing this again. Let's play a game and I'll ask you yes or no questions. Ready? Okay then. Sick and tired of hearing the same old voices on the wireless? Are you looking for an alternative opinion to the mainstream media? Do you have a thing for a Scottish accent? If your answer is no to one or more of these questions, then you need the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Listen, watch, and share the fastest growing political program in the world! Now, don't forget to visit the website of our sponsor, my dear friend Ravi, 220kminc.com. Uh, you'll thank me for it if you do. And now they're supplying everywhere in the United States and in the European Union. And I know that also they will include the UK and Australia, actually. Free shipping. If you buy two products, uh, you'd be a mug not to. Now, Ben Swan is uh, an old colleague of mine. He's a considerable financial expert with an acute political brain, too. He's the founder and CEO of Sovereign Media, and it's a pleasure to welcome him on to the mother of all talk shows. Ben, very good to see you again. Uh, it's, uh, there's so much to talk about, but can we start with this, uh, uh, this uh, Ponzi scheme that has collapsed? Yeah, absolutely. I, I appreciate kind of the context you were giving people in the beginning. You know, FTX, and you mentioned that I, I know a lot about financial issues. More specifically to your audience, if you don't know who I am, crypto issues. And I've talked about crypto for many years. I was one of the early people into Bitcoin um, and, and have followed cryptocurrency and covered it for a long time. And what's important for people to understand is that FTX is the exact opposite of everything that crypto was about. And something that I had actually warned about many, many times long before this scandal is the idea that some a company like FTX is completely centralized as opposed to the initial mission of cryptocurrency, which is to be decentralized. I've warned people for years, don't put your money into an exchange where it sits in a wallet that's controlled by a centralized exchange. Why? The reason for that, George, is because that's not your wallet. It's their wallet. In this case, it is Sam, uh, Sam Bankman frieds wallet, and he treated it like it was his wallet. He took money out of other people's wallets, acting like it was no big deal. You're right when you say he acted like a bank. Like banks do this all the time. The difference is, is that banks are federally insured to make sure that if there is some kind of misuse uh, of funds or malfeasance, then there is a, a federal insurance program that will kick in to make you whole up to $250,000. That doesn't exist in the crypto world. And so what you had was a guy who was literally stealing from his own customers, taking money directly out of what they thought were their wallets. It was really his wallet because he had all the control over it. And then he was doing something else. He was not only spending it, but he was pledging his money to go to great causes. He was, as you mentioned, giving over $40 million to Democratic candidates. And he had been greenlighted by the FTC in the United States, the Federal Trade Commission, to protect himself. He had given money to all the right people so that they wouldn't come looking. And now, all of a sudden, we have a big push for we need strict regulations for the crypto industry. And not one single regulation that's being talked about right now, I would tell you, will do anything to prevent what just happened. Instead, they wanna re restrict things like privacy coins. They wanna restrict the ability of you to keep your own wallet because you're not smart enough to, and instead allow someone like SBF, as he's known, to be the person who gets to control those wallets. So it is a scandal on so many different levels. That's, of course, without all the other issues regarding Ukraine and how that all worked out. So many scandals tied up in this particular issue. But I'll tell you, George, how you would have known that this guy was a fraud in the fact that he was a media darling. No one in the media wanted to question him or to look, take a serious look at him. They treated him like he was a genius when, in fact, he's just a crook. Yeah, the, the New York Times is still puff piecing him, even though he's in handcuffs in the Bahamas and five million people have lost their money, uh, whilst, uh, you know, Julian Assange is in a dungeon. It's unbelievable. 
It is unbelievable. So, and it's uh, unbelievable when you can sit back and pretend that someone like SBF, right, is some kind of wizard in terms of his great intelligence and financial acumen. He's been referred to as the next Warren Buffett. He was referred to, I, I believe, by Jim Cramer as being the next JP Morgan. He was going to redefine finance. The guy was just a thief. And he acted like a thief. He took people's money. He bought a sponsorship in Miami of the Miami Heat Stadium. It's FTX Arena. You know, he put his name on lots of things to make himself seem like he was important, to make himself seem like he was legitimate. And again, the media treated him great. When in fact, all he was doing was convincing people to put their money into wallets that he had access to. And he was taking that money directly out of their wallets. It's, it's the most despicable thing that I, th I think anyone could really think of in terms of uh, a financial person and how they would behave. And yet, as you said, there's still a puff piece is being written even today about him. Shouldn't the Democrats give that 40 million back to the people from whom it was stolen? Of course, but that that won't happen. What will happen is small increments, twenty five hundred dollars here, you know, a thousand dollars there will be given to charities. That's what they always say. Right is that we can't really return it to those people. So instead, we'll just donate it to charity as if donating to some charity that has nothing to do with the person who was robbed um, is somehow making up for the fact that this individual was robbed. And so that's already happening. There are a few politicians who have said, eh, we'll, we'll make donations in kind um, to, of this money to a charity, but it, that doesn't make whole the person who has been wronged here. No, absolutely. Uh, now, uh, turning to the, the broader uh, political situation, I, I read a very profound observation just a half hour ago. It said that the establishment is losing its control over soft power and that therefore it will use hard power more and more often. And whilst they can still rely on uh, some of the soft power big tech agencies, they can no longer rely on all of them. Twitter, for example, they, ha they have now effectively non-personed uh, Elon Musk as a precursor to declaring him an enemy of the state. They are crying into their man bags and tearing out their man buns uh, amongst the, uh, the uh, commentariat uh, on the West Coast uh, because they've lost their power at uh, Twitter. And so uh, what's going to happen on the whole freedom of speech front, Ben? Because you and I are, in a way, we, we're fighters on that frontier, aren't we? Without question. And I think what we're going to see is that whenever we talk about speech, right, speech is such an, a critical issue because it is the single antidote to antidote excuse me to authoritarianism the only true antidote to authoritarianism is speech the ability to stand up and to refute what's happening around you and to say what i see with my own eyes and and what i tell you with my own words right has the the power to influence and to sway you use the term soft power a minute ago the the ultimate soft power is the ability to persuade the ability of persuasion through conversation, through debate, through discussion. It can't be allowed and it can't be tolerated. And so when we, we watch the G20 summit that's going on right now and Klaus Schwab, who, why is he at the G20 summit? Why is he allowed to speak there? He's been elected by no one. Uh, no one's cast a vote for him. And yet he's standing up telling the world how, they, uh, once again, they're going to reset the world, this great reset that he keeps calling for. Um, the, the way you resist that is through speech. Well, that can't be allowed. It's why fact checkers exist. They exist for the sole purpose of silencing dissent. Social media companies employ them for the sole purpose of silencing dissent. And so what you said about hard power, absolutely. That, I think, is the next step. The question will be, uh, what tools will citizens in their own countries be able to employ in order to be able to create 
uh, structures that are protected against that hard power. It's what we're doing through, through Sovereign.media. The whole concept of our media company is that it is blockchain-based, utilizing these tools that we talked about a minute ago for cryptocurrency, utilizing those same tools to protect speech and to allow people to speak freely without governments being able to intervene and control that. This concept of social media companies being almost their own quasi governments that have their own rules about what is acceptable and what is not, uh, it, it's, it's simply unacceptable. But it has been going on for so long that a lot of the population has begun to kind of cede that ground and decide that, you know what, it's okay that they decide that they can control all public discourse and all dialogue. It's, it's simply not acceptable. No, and uh, of course, we, we know that in the Hunter Biden laptop case, that uh, all agencies of the government were deployed ruthlessly to suppress a truth. It was true uh, that uh, the laptop existed and it was true what was alleged to have been on it, though I suspect we've only seen the tip of that iceberg. And yet, 50, five zero uh, American intelligence officers were deployed as named and, and pictured uh, individuals to declare it as Russian disinformation. The New York Times and the mainstream televisions all declared it, not just false, but Russian disinformation. They mobilized every sinew of their strength because they knew that what was on Hunter's laptop might cost the big guy the presidency and might see Donald Trump re-elected and so they mobilized an army of liars. How can we stop them doing that again, Ben? Well, one, one thing we have to do is stop allowing that army of liars to come back and to be treated as if they are legitimate in the things that they say. You, you mentioned there were 50 national security you know, former, uh, you know, heads of the CIA, the FBI, the NSA, who, who got up and, and essentially put their name on a letter saying this laptop story is Russian disinformation. It is not true. They knew that was not the case. The FBI had that laptop in their possession a year before that letter was written. They absolutely knew that it was real. All they had to do was open it up and look inside. There was no question it was real because every time that Hunter Biden seems to decide he wants to be with a prostitute, he puts four cameras on his head and he records the whole thing, right? So it, it, there was no doubt that this was a legitimate laptop that legitimately belonged to him. It was filled with his emails and private messages. So here's part of the problem. Part of the problem is that we allow the same people to come back over and over without having, you know, stood up and 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 admitted faults, admitted that they were wrong. If you cannot admit that you were not only wrong, but you were dishonest when you were talking about Hunter Biden, you can't talk about anything else. At what point do we as a public say, no, 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 we're not gonna to continue to play this game. Now, right now we allow it to happen because somebody can go on CNN or Fox News and they can, they can be wrong. They can say something that's entirely discredited and there's no consequence for that. There's no consequence for uh, the, their lies or their ineptitude, either one, whether they're intentionally malicious or they're just a fool, there's no consequence for that. And so we have to no longer allow that as the public. The other thing is we have to build parallel economies for information, parallel economies for, for, for sharing information because Listen, freedom of speech means that there's going to be some bad information out there and incorrect information out there. But when you find someone within the world, right, who is consistently accurate in the things that they're saying, how do we amplify those voices? And that's another thing that we're trying to do to the platform we've built is amplify voices that are consistently correct in the things that they are saying. You know, how do you, how do you know if someone is honest? We'll just look at what they've said in the past. And, and measure up whether or not the things they have said, the comments that they have made, their, their reporting has been proven to be accurate or not. You don't have to go back very far to figure this out, especially when we're talking about all the inaccuracies right now. Go back six months and 90% and of the people who are allowed to appear on cable news or who are never censored on social media are consistently wrong in the things that they say, consistently wrong. And yet, 
they're allowed to continue to have those those positions in society in the public square where they're allowed to continue to speak. So I think as a public, we have to become much better about discrediting those people and refusing to give credence to their words, regardless of what their title might have been in the past. Finally, and I'm grateful for your time, Ben, uh, Donald Trump is off and running. What are his chances, do you think, first of being the nominee and second of defeating uh, by then the 95-year-old Joe Biden or at least he'll look 95. Well, let's say this. Let me answer the second part first. If he gets through the primary and becomes the nominee, what are his chances? Well, if, if voting machines will actually work and it doesn't take a week to count the vote afterwards, I think his chances are very good. I watched his speech, his announcement speech, and one of the things he mentioned, which I think is absolutely accurate, is the fact that gas prices have already been at record levels in the United States. They came down uh, just before the election, within the six months before the election, because Biden depleted the petroleum reserve, the strategic petroleum reserve here in the U.S., and he de depleted it in order to bring them now before the election. They'll skyrocket once again. There's a lot of people who are feeling an awful lot of pain. Inflation very, very high. It's only going to get worse. So I think that you know, if we get to a general election, another rematch of Biden and Trump, and if we actually have a level playing field in terms of, of voting, I think that Trump would ultimately prevail in that. I think anyone who runs against Biden would ultimately prevail in that. Having said that, will Trump get to that general election? And, and the question is, will, will he be primary? There's a lot of talk about Ron DeSantis, as you mentioned in the lead up, uh, and whether or not he'll be the guy to take him on. DeSantis was, has been asked about this, and he told people to calm down, stop talking about it so much, uh, because I think he's, he's kind of figuring out what he wants to do. There's a lot of money that wants DeSantis to run, uh, a lot of support within the Republican Party. They see him as the guy who can beat uh, Biden, and they see him as a better, more palatable candidate for the, the, the electorate as a whole. The problem is this. Running in a primary against Donald Trump, Trump likes to punch. And so, you know, DeSantis may want to punch back, but, but you come out of a primary pretty bruised, even if you survive it against him. And that's not saying he necessarily would. You know, Trump got a lot of criticism because he put out a tweet immediately after the election that said, can we talk about the fact that in 2020, that Trump got 1.1 million more votes in Florida than DeSantis just did in his historic win. You know, the numbers are what the numbers are. And so that's, it's kind of hard to, to argue with that. Trump has a lot of support. Um, and it, I think a primary would get, get pretty ugly. So exactly how would it play out? I don't know, but it will be interesting to watch and see. Ben, how do people follow your work? Tell us about Sovereign Media, how we can get on it. Sovereign.media, S-O-V-R-E-N dot media, not dot com, dot media is our platform. And George, by the way, we just love to invite you to bring the mother of all talk shows over to Sovereign and have your own channel there and where people can see it. You know, our goal is to create, again, a, a vibrant uh, environment for great content that won't be censored. We're blockchain based. It can't be censored or taken down, and we have decentralized, truly decentralized servers all across the world so that it can't come down. So we invite you to come and all of your audience to check it out, sovereign.media. It's a deal. Ben Swan, a pleasure, as always, to see you and talk to you. Thanks very much for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Who will be the Republican nominee? Donald Trump, still pretty uh, well ahead, but Ron DeSantis is... Uh, well, he's got between a third and, uh, and, and 42% of the uh, vote on our poll. You can vote right to the end uh, of the show. Let me take a quick break, and then it's calls. First up, Mike in South Carolina about Trump. We know Mike's view. Let's hear it after this. From the makers of Where's the WMD? Who killed Epstein and pinned the blame on the Democratic donkey? Comes the brand new game, Where's Biden Hiding? Play the tapes. Figure out what the hell he's trying to say. It is me, Joe Biden. Try and find Where's Biden Hiding? Where's Biden Hiding? 
We can't find him. This product is fictional and is not available in your local burn down store. But seriously, if anyone finds him, please let us know. Big thanks, obviously, to all our subscribers and listeners to the Moats podcast. For the older amongst you, a podcast is the distilled version, uh, about half as long, uh, which has become a phenomenon uh, on the internet. So it's a media phenomenon, and it's tearing up the mainstream uh, media monopoly. Please uh, download it on Apple or Spotify and leave us a five-star review like Sanam in London, who said, George, I've been watching your show uh, for a long time, and I must admit that you are a true leader and very courageous man to carry on your work of exposing the truth and showing us the other side of the picture, which always gets blocked by the US and the West through their media. God bless you always. Sanam in London. Very touching, Sanam. Thank you very much uh, for that. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Tell you our podcast was number one in Algeria. Did I tell you it was previously number one in Indonesia? That means all these people in Bali right now are possibly downloading it. And we were number one in Saudi Arabia of all places. We're in the charts in well over a hundred countries and territories around the world. So wherever you get your podcast from, download ours. And do please leave us a five-star review. Now, let me hear from Mike in South Carolina. Always a pleasure. Go ahead, Mike. What would you like to say? Hey, George, great to talk to you again. It's always a pleasure to talk to you too, sir. Uh, Thank you. Know, you. If, if you remember, I, I, I call the selection fiasco here exactly right as far as no red wave. You did. You'd be a long time before you ever find out who was going to be in charge of stuff. But um, the thing about it is, I mean, you told your listeners that, that you know where I stand, but I, I'm not sure you guys really know exactly where I stand. And that is, I, I hate Joe Biden. I do. I hate him. And I hate most of the Democrats, except for a few really progressive members of the Democratic Party. But I hate Donald Trump even worse. And you're, uh, you know, the uh, the thing that you gave us to pick from, either Trump or DeSantis, I, I, I think, you know, I mean, I, I, I said DeSantis on it, but, but you know, really, I don't think either one of them are going to be the, uh, uh, you know, the nominee from the Republican Party. I don't believe either one will. Oh, really? And, well, and I, give us some names yeah. then. Uh, give us some names, Mike. Well, because it's, you it's know better so than us, who else might be in yeah, the race? There, well, you know, there there are a lot of people in the in the Republican Party that would like to to get a part of that, and, and it's going to be kind of like you remember the last time when uh, Trump ran, you had like fifteen people in the Republican Party that were running. It was when he, when he first got to be president, and it's going to be a lot like that. There's yeah. going to be a lot of people in the Republican Party that are going to want, uh, you know, to run for that office. But the, you know, the thing is, I don't, you know, it's it's really hard to say at this point in time that either Trump, see, Trump only, Trump has uh, a group of people in his party that uh, 30, maybe 30, 40 percent of the Republicans back Trump. You know, the rest of them are, you know, they'll go along with it sometime if, if it's to their benefit, but otherwise they won't. But here's the real problem with, with, with Donald Trump. Just like, just like uh, uh, Liz Trust that you had there, and everybody got all upset at her. She lasted a month when she was trying to, uh, you know, give all the money away to the uh, to the rich people. Well, Trump already did that in his first term. He gave a huge uh, tax break to the ultra wealthy, and there's just no more need for that. And I, I think a lot of people now in the Republican Party are waking up to think that uh, you know maybe Trump is not the answer to all this, and DeSantis either, really. Uh, but, you know, but it's going to be a fight and there's going to be a lot of blood led. Well, of course, know, uh, there was a fight uh, when when Trump got the nomination. There was a fight, but oh, yeah. it was a very unequal one. There were 15, but Trump slayed every one of the others. Uh, and uh, exactly Jeb right. Bush and all these establishment flunkies True. that were put up against them. Uh, I remember reading the puff pieces about Jeb Bush. It was almost as if oh, he yeah. was to the man are born. Uh, but Trump uh, massacred them. Uh, yeah, he massacred he them all. 
And I, I, think, I think he'll blow away anyone that uh, stands up against him. Last word well, to you, Mike. I, I, I really don't think that he will, and, and the reason I don't think he will is because there's a big war going on right now in the Republican Party, and they can't, people, even at Fox News and places like this, they can't decide whether to actually back Trump anymore or not, or try and uh, get away from him, because sure. they'd like to get away from sure. him. They'd like to get away from his election denial and all the rest of this stuff, and all the bad candidates that he picked for this uh uh, midterm election, they'd like to get away from that. They'd like to get on with something else, but I don't think they're going to be able to do it. Mike, thanks as always. A pleasure to hear your perspectives. Here are the phone numbers if you're in the UK or Ireland. Dial this number, 0808196552. That's 0808196552. It's entirely free of charge. You call us, we'll call you back. If you're in the U.S. or Canada, equally toll-free, won't cost you a cent. It's plus one, eight four four nine four four double three double four. That's plus one, eight four four nine four four double three double four. And if you're in the rest of the world, and I promise everyone there is a rest of the world outside of the U.S. and U.K., here's the number, plus four four two zero three nine double six. Two six two five. That's plus four four two zero three nine double six two six two five. Get calling now. Kelly in North Carolina has, and Kelly is up next. Go ahead, Kelly. Hi, George. This is Kelly. Um, I, as editor on Randy Credico's Assange Countdown to Freedom, he has a lot of great guests, but I have to say you're definitely one of my favorites. Um, and currently, you, right Kelly. now, before I get into this Trump DeSantis thing, I want to say that Randy is currently in D.C. right now, still running around with that billboard truck for Assange. So if you're not familiar and you're listening he's, to this, he's, uh, he's indefatigable. Randy Credico is indefatigable for Julian Assange. Yes. No one in the world has yes, done more uh, than, yeah, uh, than Randy. God Assange. bless him. Yeah, go to Assange Countdown to Freedom dot com and you'll see uh, all the shows and the him running around with the billboard yeah, truck wonderful. still. But uh, um, regard to, I said DeSantis, um, and I mean I live in the South. I'm not from the South, um, but I know there's a lot of support still for Trump. But my feeling is like uh, the previous caller in my neighboring state here in South Carolina said, is that you know there is a lot of the Republican establishment does not want Trump. And I think that there's also a lot of fatigue, like maybe even among some Trump supporters that they know it's going to be a media circus for another four years. And the Democrats need a boogeyman. And of course, Trump fills that, fits that bill. But I actually, I do think DeSantis, because he's very popular in Florida, um, I did some work with Tim Canova's campaign down there, and I know a lot of people there, even progressives, have been pleased with some of the things, not all, but some of the things that DeSantis has done. So I think we need to watch what Tulsi Gabbard does um, in relation to DeSantis, whether it's a VP run or, um, or just sort of maybe bringing people over. Um, to in a way to bring them I'd, more back I'd into love the establishment. Yeah, I, I'd love to see Tulsi Gabbard uh, in office. Uh, of course, I don't agree with her on everything, and she won't agree with me on hardly anything. But the crucial things, like war and peace, like the Ukraine scam, uh, she is very clear-sighted about it, far more than any so-called progressive Democrats, Sanders and uh, his crew, the bomb squad, AOC, and so on. Uh, Tulsi Gabbard is infinitely clearer on these issues of war and peace. I'd love to see that. Just before you go, Kelly, use the wonderful word boogeyman. I've always thought it was spelt B-O-O-G-E-Y, man. Uh, but in fact, it comes from Indonesian pirates, the boogie pirates, B-U-G-G-I. Boogeyman was the, uh, the fear that you put into kids, the boogeyman will get you. The boogeyman was an Indonesian pirate captain. Ke Kelly, give my regard to Randy, please, and thanks.
for that lovely call. Uh, Robert is in the Bronx. We better go to the Bronx. They're tough there. Let's see if Robert wants a fight with me. Apparently he does. Go on, Robert. No, good. That was my I've been I've been following you since you socked it to the senators. I think it was twenty years ago, or <laughs> fifteen years ago. I, I just wanted yeah, to yeah. ask you, George, why do you, ha- you have yeah. you, you have uh, you have guests on, and everybody mm-hmm. seems to be up on Trump. Have you forgotten? Has everybody forgotten four years of Donald Trump? Donald Trump is a racist. Donald Trump is a draft dodger. Driver, Donald Trump is a pathological liar. And don't people forget that for four years, all all his BS, all his bullshit. How quickly we forget all that bullshit? I don't understand that. You had Hinkle on the other day. You had this guy. You had this guy here earlier today. Donald Trump is like the worst nightmare Americans can want. Why would we be so up on? I'm gonna be honest with you. Well, well, I'd rather uh, have a senile Joe. Hold, hold. I'd rather have a senile Joe Biden. And have that dangerous son of a bitch in the White House. That's my opinion. That's well, that's, that, that's the difference uh, between us. I wouldn't rather have Joe Biden uh, than Donald Trump, although I agree with everything you said about Donald Trump. Uh, but I, I'd put the, the conclusion the other way around. It is already abundantly clear that Joe Biden may well take the world into World War III. And... I'm afraid everything else pales into insignificance compared to that, Robert. I think that Trump is less likely uh, to cause World War III uh, than Joe Biden is. I think, I think Trump is much less likely to go to war with Russia than Joe Biden is. And I pray in aid of my argument, the history of the last two years, the history of the last 24 hours. Last word to you, Robert. Okay, let me ask you. If he was president, would he have made a difference now with this Ukraine war? He made a difference. He would have made a difference. Yeah, it would never have happened. I'm absolutely convinced it would oh, never have happened. Um, George, come on. I have, I have to disagree with you on that well, one, George. Didn't he well, kill that Iranian, Iranian It's a counterfactual general? argument. Didn't he kill that Iranian general over we there? Well, I, I, I've, said, I've said many times, he would have done a deal. He would have done a deal with Putin to implement the Minsk agreement, uh, which would have avoided this war in the first place. I I think that for the same reason he went to the parallel between North and South Korea and and shook hands with the little rocket man, that's the kind of character he is, even though he is all the things that you said. The difference is, is Biden a more dangerous SOB uh, than Donald Trump and most people watching and listening would have to conclude that I'm right and you're wrong. But I've got to point this out to you, Robert. You are the third caller in a row that is against Donald Trump. And if you read between the lines of what Ben Swan, our guest, was saying, he thought that DeSantis would be the better bet in running for president. So your characterization of the show as some kind of Trump fan club is quite simply wrong. Now, thanks, Robert. Uh, In the Bronx, uh, I've I've fought a man in the Bronx. It's not often anyone can say that. And I came out alive. Thanks, Robert. Uh, Super Chats, uh, of course, are the way to help the fighting fund of the mother of all talk shows. We never know uh, when we can go to three times a week. That's my ambition, Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday. But we'll get there sooner if you support us. And if you are watching on YouTube, please go to the Super Chat mechanism and make a donation. Give a comment, and your comment will come up here, and I will read it out. If you're not watching on YouTube, then go to uh, moats.tv, our website, and please donate there. Many people have been uh, given. I hope to get the chance to read some of it out. But it's the witching hour. After the break, we will hear from the one and only Farhan Franchek about the U.S. midterms, about Trump, about Biden, and about all the great political issues that we are dealing with this evening. 
But I do need your calls uh, because after Farhan, the show is yours. 0808196552 if you're in the UK or Ireland. And if you're in the US or Canada, plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. If you're in the rest of the world, four four two zero three nine double six two six two five. You're tuned to the mother of all talk shows, and it would not have been possible but for two twenty km inc dot com. Ravi, I take my hat off to you. And if I did, you'd see how smooth my forehead now is as a result of your cosmetics. And now I can eat them. That's how pure they are. Thanks, Ravi. I'll be back right after this. I am, always have been, and always will be, firmly opposed to any changes in the law to allow assisted dying or assisted suicide. I believe the threat to the dependent, the most vulnerable, um, the most desperate in our society is simply too great. And therefore, assisted dying or legalized, legalized assisted suicide must never become law in this country. Thank you, George. Thank you very Bravo, much, I, I agree entirely and uh, spoke, uh, I hope, powerfully in Parliament against this euthanasia, legalized murder. I have uh, the most profound feelings of opposition to it, which, as you say, does not mean that the pressures on uh, people who are terminally ill, who have lost hope, are not uh, themselves profound and that the pressures on people without pay and without any kind of remittance or relief are condemned to years, decades of caring for people who are terminally ill, helpless, hopeless and so on, that these are not deep, deep minds of anguish and of pain and of doubt. But I have a moral and religious obligation to oppose it. If capitalism was a person and it could kill anyone that it liked, it would kill the one that will never again turn a penny of profit. It's very easy to imagine. Relatives, even family members, even husbands and wives that would like to see the back of you, either because they think you've suffered long enough or because they'd quite like to see what's in your will and quite like to spend it. I wouldn't trust and I don't think you should anybody to decide whether you live or die. As a religious believer, I believe that that is God's job, not yours. This is a subject we'll have to uh, return You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. You're tuned to the mother of all talk shows and this second hour would not be possible if not for our sponsor, the brilliant new phone app with a twist to gather. Robert Feder is the CEO. You saw me interview him a couple of weeks back on the first night of their sponsorship. Since when? It's been growing like topsy. There's been an excellent response from the Moats uh, audience, a tremendous number of people downloading and joining uh, together. That's spelt to the number two, gather, lose the E, G-A-T-H-R. That's the number two, G-A-T-H-R. It's basically a speaker's corner. Uh, you can, uh, if they want you to, locate the others in your area in your workplace, in your street, who are, for example, fans of the mother of all talk shows. If they say on Together that they are, you can make a little group, albeit a virtual one. You could watch the mother of all talk shows together and comment on it to each other on there it is there uh, together. It doesn't cost you anything. Please download it. 
uh, because uh, Together are the sponsors of the midweek mother of all talk shows in the second hour. Uh, let's uh, do some of those uh, uh, super chats that I mentioned. Sean Bebbington, uh, I know that name, gives £6.49 and says, please give a shout out to the Workers' Party of Britain, Birmingham members. Big shout out to the Birmingham members of the Workers' Party of Britain, which I have the great honour to lead. And I'm speaking at the Workers' Party meeting on Saturday night in Manchester. It's the gig they tried to ban. For weeks I've been building, and my friends have been building, a meeting in a pub in central Manchester uh, called the Old Monkey. Well, they tried to make a monkey out of me, that is for sure. They saw us building a big and successful meeting, uh, and then on Monday, uh, without any lawful excuse, they pulled the rug from underneath us and cancelled the meeting. They invented false reasons why they had done so, not knowing that we have an actual recording of the telephone call in which the whole thing was cancelled. So when it comes to the court, the monkey will be them because all of their lies will be exposed. So we're suing them. But our good friends in the Irish Centre in Cheatham Hill in Manchester have stepped in. You can always count on the Irish. So it's at 6.30 on Saturday night in the Irish Centre in Cheatham Hill, Manchester. I hope all my friends in Manchester will come, if only to tell the old monkey that they won't make a monkey out of us. By the way, I'm doing uh, the mother of all talk shows road show in Sunderland uh, in uh, February. It is astonishing. It's months away and the tickets are going like hotcakes. I hope we can put up the banner uh, for that. Scouser Larp, my old friend in Liverpool, gives £4.49. Ukraine probably did this to frame Russia and thus draw NATO into the war, as Ukraine is probably running dry of weapons and men. Well, it's one of two things, uh, uh, my friend. It's either that this rocket arrived in Poland entirely by accident and Zelensky demanded a NATO response and continues to insist that it was a Russian weapon that killed these two unfortunates in Poland. It's either that, uh, he deliberately lied about all of that, is continuing to deliberately lie, or it was a genuine error. A genuine error, sir. I thought it was a Russian missile, and unfortunately it was a Ukrainian one. If you believe the latter, I've got a bridge in London right behind me uh, that I could sell you going cheap. Uh, tax Dodger gives £1.21. Sean McPartland gives £8.99. Thank you for signing my poster last week in Stockport, George. I'll be signing myself up to become a Workers' Party member at the weekend. Keep up the great work. Keep speaking the truth. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. And Mr. Lover, a regular donor, gives five pounds. John Fitzy gives two pounds. Uh, Lover of the Russian team gives one pound 79. Sick of all this BS from the media. Tony Donovan gives 50 US dollars. George, serious question, why cannot the Celts, Celts in Scotland, Ireland and Wales form their own union and kick England to the curb? Peace and love to you and family. I don't hold with all that blood and soil uh, stuff. I don't think I even am a Celt. I'm just a person that was born in Scotland and who speaks English and who has more in common with the people who think like me uh, in Manchester and Liverpool uh, than I do with people who think like the nationalists or the conservatives for that matter who happen to have been born or live along the road from me in Scotland. It's really quite simple. We're a small island. I don't believe in partitioning small islands. I never supported the partition of Ireland. So why would I support the partition of Britain? It's really not rocket scientist. Here's the uh, artwork for the Sunderland gig. Um, I'm looking forward to it very much. I hope Sunderland are playing at home uh, that weekend. 
Uh, it's Monday the 7th of February and uh, you can get the tickets from ticketsource.co.uk. That's rather nice, that. That actually is the curtain at the theatre in Stockport where we did the last one. If you saw it, you'll know that uh, Gayatri does vox pops with the people who come to the show and they then appear on the subsequent edition of Motes. Uh, and I think it's a formula that works. I talk about the show, I talk about my own life, I talk about the great political issues of the day, then I sign books and posters and so on. So please uh, let me have your presence in Sunderland if you can possibly get there. Now my good friend Farhan Fronchak is the next guest. She has educated and entertained us about all things American throughout the 188 editions of the Mother of All talk shows. Either she's on the show as a guest or she's watching it and commenting on it. She thinks I don't see her comments, but I do and love them. I love Farhan Fronchak. I know that many of you do. Here she is on the Mother of All talk shows. Farhan, let's uh, talk uh, first, if we may, about the Donald Trump announcement. How was it in terms of theatre? I only saw a little clip of it. Was it a successful launch? Or was it a kind of soft launch, a kind of more in sorrow than in anger launch? I've seen that said. You know, George, it's interesting. When you remember 2016 of Donald Trump coming down the escalator, uh, it was this grand moment. Uh, his speech was very angry, very fiery. Uh, I've, I, you know, I, when I was streaming it live last night on my own channel, um, after watching it, I want to call it the rebrand. He's, it, this is like a Trump rebrand. He was very much more soft spoken than we normally see him. He was uh, very to the point on a lot of his uh, different uh, remarks that he made. You know, he talked about China. He talked about building the rest of the wall. He talked about uh, critical race theory being taught in schools and kind of touched on those social issues. Not a lot of the name calling that we're, that we're used to seeing, you know, like the little Marco and, you know, the crooked Hillary, none of that. Uh, you didn't see a lot of comedy or that feistiness. It was a much more reserved you could almost say state elder statesman uh, type of uh, vibe coming from Trump last night, which has a lot of people either really, really happy or or much, you know, like kind of or actually no, not happy. I would say confused, I think would probably be the better word. And then the, the Trump base being like, why wasn't he fiery? Why didn't he show his passion? You know, I had a journalist on with my uh, with me last night when we were streaming it who, you know, she's like, I miss the fiery Trump. I miss that guy. And I said, you know what? Here's the thing, though. His base knows who he is. This isn't a rally. It was much more statesmanlike. Again, it's he has to appeal now ever since the midterms. And we didn't see that red wave with the Republicans like they thought they would. We only saw a little bit of a ripple. He now has to win those independent moderate voters back. And this, I think, last night, uh, George, was a complete and total rebrand of, of the Trump uh, that we all kind of came to know. Well, it could have been a carefully calculated strategy of rebranding, uh, or it could be that his heart's not in it. Uh, um, and uh, maybe it's a negotiating uh, posture. After all, uh, there's been a big lobby to uh, criminalize him, to charge him uh, on one bogus uh, case after another, taking you know, pencils and rubbers home from the White House and keeping them at uh, his <laughs> home, uh, or metaphorically at least. Uh, it may be that now, as a candidate for president, he feels that they're much less likely to serve indictments on him, make criminal charges on him, because that would indeed be a major issue for American democracy if one party was trying to imprison uh, their rival candidate. Uh, so it could be that, or it could be that he's older and wiser, uh, in which case he might not, as you've said, be able to sufficiently energize his base. What, what, what's your thinking on that? You know, 
as far as the older and wiser comment, I would say for your last caller, probably would totally disagree with you on that one. Uh, but there are people, though, that, you know, especially many of the people around him are much different. If you remember 2016, he had Kellyanne Conway, Corey Lewandowski. These people are human pit bulls. I mean, they just went after the press. They went after candidates. They went after everybody. Um, and, and, and there was no stone unturned when it came to that primary of who they went after. Everybody got burned. Uh, now, his communications manager, uh, the, the folks that are in his team, it's a whole new it's a whole new chessboard here. Uh, you actually had his communications manager uh, just before the speech talking to uh, the news outlets saying, you know, you're going to see a different Trump. He's a little bit more reserved. Uh, so that's where you're going to see. Um, again, if you watch the speech last night, the only complaints that many people had is that it went on way too long. It started to get a little bit rumbly. Or, you know, he started to kind of ramble a little bit. And you actually saw the mainstream media from the likes of, well, MSNBC didn't even air it, uh, but you know the, the Republican outlets, they started to cut him off and, and go back into regular programming, whereas before, they were there start to finish. They were even there 45 minutes before he even took the stage. It's a completely different dynamic now. And I think one of the things is, you're seeing, for example, with this whole midterm election, uh, many of the people that were election deniers that Trump uh, propped up, most of those, if not all of those people lost their election. Where I mean, we're going to see and wait for Herschel Walker and see what happens with him as far as winning that Georgia Senate seat on December 6th. But, you know, having this idea that, OK, the economy's bad, gas prices are up. OK, Democrats are, are you know, they totally, you know, poop the bed on this one. We This is an easy win for us. And when voters went out and they saw, you know what? I don't know. And they didn't see that red wave. That to me shows that voters thought, you know what? I just don't believe you. I don't believe you anymore. So I'm just going to stick with who I was with in 2020. And that's where Republicans have a lot of work to do. You can sit there and talk a great game, but you got to deliver on your promises. And right now, the Republicans are just known as telling you what's wrong. And yep, that's what needs to be fixed. But it's like, but how? Uh, Democrats have the same problem, too, but it's just this. The ball was in the Republican court this go around and they didn't score any great points. And with Trump, he's going to have to have to somewhat sit and deal with that and live with it. But also uh, he's known for picking horrible people around him. You know, you look at one of his first hires, John Bolton, the neocon of all neocons. People don't want that. People don't want to be involved in these wars. They're seeing how yesterday they were with the whole thing that happened with Poland, how now Congress wants to send another $37.3 billion over to Ukraine. More money. Americans are tired of it. And yes, he can sit and talk a great game. But at the end of the day, I think people do want some normalcy. They, they have liked a little bit of the normalcy with Biden. However, they do want somebody that's going to stand up and do something just not in the bull in the china shop type of approach anymore. Well, uh, you put your finger on one possible uh, um, clear red water that could be put between the two parties that would save the American people a lot of money and a lot of blood. Uh, I saw a tweet from Trump's son, Donald Trump Jr. this evening, in which he said, now that we know uh, that Ukraine attacked our NATO ally Poland with a missile, can we at least stop sending billions of taxpayer dollars to them? If Trump were to become the anti-war leader right now, if he were to say, enough is enough, no more money, send me, I'll fix this, I'll make sure that this doesn't get any worse, that actually could begin to build a head of steam behind him that nobody else could live with. Right. But the only thing is, though, is that people still, you know, especially on the left, they still see him as this, you know, um, bombastic, uh, you know, uncertain type of character. Now, what is interesting, what's very interesting from what I'm hearing in my Republican circles uh, in D.C., um, which the Democrat, it hasn't even hit their circles yet. They're talking about VP options, right? Uh, since he's announced, he's got it, you know, and usually you, you, you announce VP options after you win the nomination. They're, they're playing it as if Trump has won the nomination. They think he's going to get it. And he has a very, very good chance of doing it. 
one of the people that's being floated for vice president that had my entire chat saying, I will, you know what, hands down, even if I hate Trump, I will vote for him on this one. Senator Rand Paul, son of Ron Paul, uh, who was very beloved uh, by the American people. Senator Rand Paul making a name for himself, going up against Dr. Fauci, going up against, uh, you know, the war in Ukraine and all this money that's being sent along with Congressman Massey, uh, where they've been asking these questions over and over and over again. Uh, my chat just lit up when they saw the name Rand Paul. And that is a name that is being floated for the vice presidential nomination under Trump. And having somebody like that, who is known to be very anti-war, who is has that very uh, staunch American libertarianism uh, name strapped to him, and he's widely known for that, that could be the key that brings over some of those moderates that says, you know, well, I don't like Trump. At least we have a guy like Rand in there to, to, who will, who has stood up against Trump before, who has primaried against him in 2016. Uh, that's a name that uh, is being floated, and a lot of people immediately had excitement for that one, George. Very interesting. I'm sure they will uh, uh, now on this show also. Uh, lastly, I know you, you don't have a crystal ball, but it's not long to the Georgia runoff. Who are the runners and riders there, and what do you think the likely outcome will be? Well, I actually will be in Georgia uh, for Dece on December 6th for that runoff. So if you need somebody on the ground there, I'm there. Uh, but oh, it's going to be will, uh, yes. <laughs> it's going to be the uh, senator incumbent, uh, the Democrat, Raphael Warnock, against the Republican Herschel Walker. Now, here was the interesting thing about all of this. Um, I have a friend in the Walker campaign who said that immediately when they decided that this was going to be going to a runoff, which you have to get over uh, 50, 50 plus one um, in order to win that seat, they did not. So now the bottom candidate, which was a libertarian candidate, is thrown off the ballot. Hence the special election. Uh, a lot of voters in Georgia feeling a little bit too much like, OK, I voted enough. We've dealt with this already, but they got to come out and do it one more time. Um, my friend in the Walker campaign told me that immediately the Trump campaign was called and said, don't worry about it. We got it. We're just going to we're going to have senators come in and stump for Herschel. Stay home. Just you you worry about your campaign. You do you, boo. And <laughs> the, the Trump team was like, OK, it's one less thing for us to do. And then the Ron DeSantis team was called and said, hey, you want to come on the campaign trail and campaign with Herschel Walker for the next three weeks? And it looks like wow. DeSantis is going to be going. Uh, you got Ted Cruz. You got Mitch McConnell. You got, you know, the usual suspects, Rick Scott. Um, you go, you got all these other Republicans that are going down there. I think uh, it's going to be interesting. Uh, I mean, I'm sure Trump already knows, but when he sees That's quite a high in risk, action, though, Farhan. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very yeah, high, it's risk, quite high I mean, risk. World I mean, War uh, Three. There's the, another if one. If DeSanta <laughs> spends three weeks there and they don't win, uh, then Trump will say, "Look, that was because you kept me out of the campaign, and look how popular DeSanta is. He's nothing without me." I mean, I could write that for Trump right now. Right, exactly, and that's where they do think, though, with his with DeSantis' star power, as far as when it comes to your local governorship you know like that that local guy you know he's not he's nationally known but he's more of a local governor um having that star power and then being just one state over uh it, they think that that's going to actually help drive people out to the polls uh because herschel walker you know he was one of the greatest running backs of all time probably not one of the greatest politicians you know and so he's going to need a little bit of help to get over that hump however if you have all these other republicans to get, to get, that are throwing ball Exactly. Yeah. He's going to need some help to get the ball, to get over, the ball the line, over the line. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, the, the thing show, is, you is if you have these other Republicans. You need to explain to me and the British audience and Europeans what a running back is. Farhan Fronchak, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> the guy who takes all the hits, George. The guy who the takes all the hits. Of all talks. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Who will be the Republican nominee is our poll this evening. And uh, Trump's still ahead. But not that comfortably, or at least not that overwhelmingly on Twitter, 58 to 42. On YouTube, quite persuasively, 69 to 31. And on Telegram, 68 to 32. Follow me on Telegram, please. T.me forward slash George Galloway. And if you are watching on YouTube, please subscribe to the channel and give it a thumbs up.
you'd be amazed at what that does for Mr. Algorithm and his nefarious intentions. I'll be right back after this with a call from Matthew in Valencia. Who wouldn't want to? See you in a second. Together is a new app combining unique ways for you to search, discover, and share with others near you and everywhere around the world. Start from your location and jump in on what's going on around you. You can discover others through posts and pins relating to places and watch your streams come to life with people, places, and ideas. Like me, near me. Download to gather now. We're charting now with our podcast in 130 countries and territories around the world. And we're in the top 10 in the United Arab Emirates, Indonesia, where we're number one, Croatia, Egypt, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Poland, and Nigeria, and even the Cayman Islands, even the tax dodgers. There's new episodes every Tuesday and Friday. You can listen to the very best of moats anywhere and at any time. You can also get the episodes a day earlier if you are a supporter of mine on Patreon. All my live shows, it's my extensive podcast archive, my audio books narrated by me. So please uh, consider supporting me on Patreon and get your moats podcast wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a five-star review will you who likes that war of the worlds everyone that's listened to it apparently i'm not orson wells but i'm the next best thing alive today uh, i'm reading on my patreon war of the worlds i'll tell you why uh, you'll, when you've heard me do it, you'll know why there was mass panic in the United States when it was broadcast on the radio in 1938 with cars crashing and people jumping off bridges because they thought it really was a Martian invasion of planet Earth. I'm not sure I wouldn't welcome a Martian invasion of planet Earth. It'd do a better job than the people running the world at the moment. Let's hear from Matthew in Valencia in Spain. Go ahead, Matthew. George, I've got a blast from the past for you. Long-time listener, first-time caller. When was the last time you heard that one? And it's true. So I've Thank got a you. question for you. Um, yeah, do you remember those days, the radio days? And I actually listened to, as a child, um, the War of the Worlds, and it scared the crap out of me. But my question to you today, George, is... It is good, actually... Uh, it's, I'm it. reading it, and it's frightening. Yeah, sorry, Matthew. Oh, dear... Oh dear, it was, it was. I mean, I don't know how old I was. I was in the 70s, and um, as you can tell, I'm in Valencia, Spain, but clearly my accent's telling you where I'm from. So um, my question to you today, George, is about what to, to sort of describe to the West, because your intro today was absolutely spectacular, but could you describe to the West that getting rid of Putin is not a walk in the park, that behind him is a Petrushev, or you have a Medvedev who has been now born again sort of um, uh, hawk yeah. in the uh, Russian domain. Getting rid of Putin is no answer to sort of serenity. Um, so that's my deal to, uh, very, to, very to get good your Matthew. take. Very, very, uh, yeah, very important uh, question. Uh, first of all, this did not happen because of Putin. It did, Putin didn't wake up one morning and say, uh, you know what, I'm going to invade Ukraine. Uh, this happened because Russia's vital national interests have been increasingly threatened by NATO ever since the fall of the Soviet Union and the false promise that was made by the Americans that NATO would not expand one inch to the east. This promise, entirely fake, uh, has been uh, honored in the breach in a spectacular manner so that now all around the Russian frontier, in the Baltics and in Poland, and as was obviously about to happen in Ukraine, the American nuclear missiles that they would never allow pointed at them. Imagine the idea of 
uh, Russian nuclear missiles being in Mexico or in Canada or in Cuba as they once were, if you recall. Uh, the idea that they would allow such a thing is preposterous. Yet they uh, purport to uh, think that Russia should allow it. Well, Russia is a very important country, an ancient and powerful country with a formidable nuclear firepower. And it's not going to allow its enemies to park their nuclear weapons on, on the frontier. So that's why this happened in, uh, in Ukraine. And it didn't happen in February of this year. It happened at least in 2014 when the neutral government in Kiev was overthrown in a violent coup uh, which was organized by the United States and the European Union. So first of all, it's not because there's a guy called Putin in the Kremlin that this is happening. It would be happening whomsoever was in the Kremlin. Secondly, the alternative to Vladimir Putin is the Russian Communist Party. They are the opposition in the Russian Duma, not some liberal that is well recognized on the pages of the Guardian, but supported by a tiny handful of people in Russia. This is just wishful thinking. Uh, why has Medvedev been born again, as you put it? And he definitely has. I was talking about him just yesterday. He's been born again because it's popular. It is seen by the Russian public, more than 80% of them, nearly 85% of them, that Russia is doing exactly what it has to do in Ukraine to preserve its sovereignty, its integrity, and so on. So Medvedev has become born again because, well, one day I presume he would like to be president again. And he could never be president if he was perceived by the public to be a backslider on Russia's national security. Uh, but uh, in elections, there's only two big parties in Russia. One of them is Putin's party, and the other one is the Communist Party. You choose. John in New York is up next on the US elections. Go ahead, John. How are you doing? Good evening. Uh, love listening to your show, and uh, you're an outstanding person for humanity, so thank you so much for taking my call. Um, thank you. you know, God as I bless listen you, John. To the call thank you. No, God bless you, sir. You know, as I listen to the callers and, you know, a lot of the Republican advocates out there, it seems that they are just susceptible to the rhetoric suggestive of a trump DeSantis feud that I suggest is being spewed as a disruptive tactic by the Dem Democratic Party. And this is exactly what the Democrats want the Republican voter base to focus on and think about. It seems to be a, a successful tactic in fomenting discord and confusion, ultimately weak weakening the party as a whole. Um, so I wanted to know what are your you know, impressions of my suggestion here? And, um, and, you know, and what do you think about uh, the, the idea of having Trump and DeSantis actually have a sit down you know, and a dialogue you know, to, to dispel any rumors of, about what's going on? Well, I mean, on the latter point, uh, John, it's, uh, it's not rocket science. It's uh, a must. I'm not a, a Republican. I'm not on their campaign team. But if they asked me for my advice, I'd say sit down yesterday uh, and ensure that you're not both running against each other. I don't rate DeSantis as highly as uh, some do and as some are pretending to do for the reasons you alluded to. Uh, the, uh, the fact is that Trump got one and a half million votes in Florida more than DeSantis got. Uh, and he was running for his incumbent position uh, as, uh, as, as governor of the state. So uh, I believe that uh, Trump is the more powerful candidate of the two. I think he could generate uh, a base which would be far bigger and far more energetic. I don't believe that, that in the uh, far reaches of the United States, Ron DeSantis is anything like as known or as popular as, uh, as Donald Trump is. And I think that is an obvious point uh, to make. And the current 
media love affair with Ron DeSantis would, of course, quickly uh, dissipate if he was the candidate. If he was the candidate for president against Joe Biden, all these liberal journalists that are talking him up now would be talking him down then. Of course, uh, Trump brings with him a tremendous amount of baggage, but he always had that baggage. And he won the presidency in 2016, and he got 11 million votes more than he got in 2016. In 2020, and it may be, I'm not in a position to say, that there was widespread cheating uh, in that election. There's certainly a lot of strange things happen in American elections when the polls have closed, uh, but also when they're actually uh, happening. So uh, it's, uh, it's a no-brainer uh, that they should resolve this matter themselves. I think the VP pick, as Farhan was just telling us, is unusually important. If uh, Trump were to pick a uh, Rand Paul or a uh, Tulsi Gabbard, uh, that would be that would be very powerful and persuasive in the multiple constituencies that, uh, of course, have to be satisfied. Thanks, John, for that call. John Fitzy gives two pounds. C Mavuso gives eight pounds ninety-nine. Please, Gigi, invite Professor John Mearsheimer. Uh, on to the mother of all talk shows. We have uh, many times uh, invited him, and I hope one day he'll be able to do it. J.J. Gill gives two pounds, a wee donation to the Fighting Fund. Thank you, J.J., nothing we about it. If everyone watching here sent one dollar, one pound, or one euro, well, we'd be quids in. Uh, we'd be halfway there. Uh, Linda Petit gives ten pounds. Thank you, Linda. And La Hope gives $2. How about a Trump DeSantis ticket? Well, of course, that's a possibility, but that would be two Florida guys running for president. Might not be the wisest thing. And Trump might feel that, well, DeSantis couldn't really be relied upon in the way that Mike Pence turned out not to be reliable. Albert Sontag, who is just a gem. I hope I meet you one day, Albert double donated with two $10 contributions. Thanks. Albert Darren Henry gives $8.99. Nikola Biberovich gives two pounds. Thanks, Nikola. Giles McComish gives 10 pounds. What a wonderful name. Hello, my friend. I'll see you in Sunderland in February. Actually, quite a few Scottish people are coming, Giles. Um, I suppose Sunderland is as far north uh, as we're going to take the show. So uh, I look forward to that, Giles, and thanks for the donation. Lena Duggan gives 10 US dollars. Kyle Wool gives 2 US dollars. William Howard, 2 British pounds. I'm grateful to all of you. Keith gives 6.99 Canadian dollars. Good show, George. Nice to hear the truth. Cheers from Canada. And Asif Ashraf gives 1 pound 70. Nine. Military Views gives two dollars, no, two euros. Uh, Farhan, please marry me. George, the best ever. Farhan, if you're still watching, I have no idea of your marital status, and I don't want to cause any trouble, but you are very widely loved by the audience of this show. I hope you know that. Uh, Roar Axdal uh, sends 55 Norwegian crowns. Good evening. Why don't you invite Graham Phillips into your talk show? Uh, I'm sure the editor has noted that. James King gives three U.S. dollars. Uh, Zanbex gives ten U.S. dollars. I've got a fly in my studio. You wouldn't expect it at this time of year. Lisa is in Seattle. Let's hear from her. Lisa, welcome. Thank you. What I just wanted to say is I really feel strongly, and I'm just kind of visiting Seattle because of my, my daughter and grandbabies, but um, I just feel so strong for President Trump, and I truly believe he's the real president, and I don't think America will ever, and I mean ever, be the America that the world globally feels that we are with freedom unless he serves that second term and the freedom of the vote. 
and I and I know many people well, feel the uh, same way. Let me they ask may you, not say let it. Let me ask you. Yeah. Let me ask you, Lisa. Uh, I know now what you want, but what do you think will happen? Will Trump beat any candidates up against him for the nomination? And can he beat Joe Biden, in your view, given the results of the midterms last week? Yes and yes. Now, what I feel, the way because of all this voting machine, and I won't say the words, but the voting machines and all that, I would love to see him run with Rand Paul, uh, especially after what happened with Pence. And you just said it all, what I was thinking just a moment ago. But I feel like the way I see many other people so supportive of DeSantis, and, and he's doing great in Florida, I feel like if he, if he were VP to Trump, then it would be so solid that even if there were any more shenanigans or everything, they would just be it would be too powerful that that they would it would just no matter what happened they would they would they would be still be president and vice president even with all this all of a sudden these pouring in of votes days weeks later i mean i i believe there would just be such a public outcry so my pr first preference is president trump and uh rand paul senator rand paul i believe and um but because of the way people think you know democrat republican democrat whatever I feel like the really solid would be Trump and DeSantis. Because even when DeSantis gets in, they're going to start finding and going after him. But I think he's partially... Oh, sure. Still... No doubt about that. All, the, all these columnists that are showering him with praise now will be showering him with something less pleasant, Lisa. Enjoy your time in Seattle. I uh, have had uh, many a good time there myself. Tamba is in Dublin. Wants to talk about the Poland missile incident. Tamba in Dublin, welcome. Hello, George. I've been a welcome, a sir. What would you like line. to say? I've been I've been a very uh, a very long term follow of yours since your days in uh, on, on press TV with the comments so that you had over there. Thank you so, so much. Really in a Thank you follow so much. Your your YouTube and then your. Your political views strongly, strongly uh, agree, and in a way, you've helped shape my um, political views. Thank you a lot for that. Um, regarding my question, um, what do you think would be the the motive of the uh, Ukrainians for for the attack in Poland? You think it's a it's a way for well, they, uh, want, they to want to get the to, NATO involved? They, they, they want to, yeah, Tamba. They want to. In fact, they need to uh, widen the war. Uh, the Russian army, of course, cannot be defeated by them. And in the long term, probably over this winter, uh, they will not be able to stop the Russian army advancing and advancing and taking ever more territory uh, from the rump West Ukrainian state, which will become like Kosovo, uh, a kind of uh, NATO protectorate uh, that you as an EU taxpayer uh, will end up uh, carrying on your back for the rest of time. Uh, so what's the only way that they can prevail is to bring the Americans and the Europeans formally uh, with boots on the ground into the war. And that's why I say this was a false flag provocation. Uh, some say it was a mistake. I would accept that if Zelensky had been less clear about what he said happened yesterday and if he was not still insisting against all the evidence against the Polish government, against the American government, against the Pentagon, against NATO and against the EU, all of whom say it was a Ukrainian rocket, Zelensky is still insisting it was a Russian rocket. And that shows to me that he's a desperate liar. And that, that's exactly where uh, he uh, found the motivation to uh, stage what I think, as I don't have any evidence for it, but I think time will tell and people will tell because you can't stage a false flag without uh, people uh, in the end talking about it and talk, they will.
Let me take a quick break and then more calls right up to 11 o'clock. Together is a new app combining unique ways for you to search, discover, and share with others near you and everywhere around the world. Start from your location and jump in on what's going on around you. You can discover others through posts and pins relating to places and watch your streams come to life with people, places, and ideas. Like me, near me. Download to gather now. Tom says after independence, we could choose the government we want. Tom, could you not have called me and argued that nonsense? Couldn't you? What's wrong with you, man? And Ben says, could Scotland actually do better autonomously? Like I want California to secede, but I think we'd thrive if not burdened by the rest of the US. How very revealing of you, Ben. How utterly revealing of you. And Philip says, how any Labour or Tory supporter has the nerve to say the SNP are corrupt is beyond me. Why do you people not have the guts to call up instead of cowering behind one single name on social media? To those of you calling for a no-fly zone in this studio, I wish, but it's too late now. The show's only got 15 minutes left to run, and by the time I chased this fly down and killed it, it wouldn't be worth my while. Now, I gave you the wrong day for the uh, Sunderland Roadshow, unfortunately. It's Tuesday, the 7th of February. Tuesday, the 7th of February, please. Uh, oh, there it is now, uh, done properly. Tuesday, the 7th of February. On the line from Ontario in Canada is Michelle. On Donald Trump, let's hear from Michelle. Go ahead. Hi, George. How are you? All good. Thanks for calling. Great. Um, great to hear it. Um, we really love your show. I just wanted to say that first of all. But I'd like to know what you really think of Donald Trump and why you don't like him as much as it sounds like you do. Uh, well, look, I'm a, a socialist, so I'm not going to be in love with uh, a socialite uh, a billionaire like uh, Donald Trump, who gave away uh, a bonanza to the richest people in America in his first budget. I'm not going to like a man that uh, took the risk uh, to the peace of the world uh, of assassinating General Soleimani, the Iranian general that was successfully fighting ISIS and Al-Qaeda, uh, wherever they reared their ugly heads. I'm not going to love a man that rained down bombs and missiles on Syria and sent American forces uh, to Syria. Of course, I cannot. Uh, my position is more uh, nuanced than that, Michel. Uh, if you force me to pick between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, I pick Donald Trump. Uh, that's not the uh, ideal choice for me, uh, but American politics is bifurcated in that way. Uh, this is the, the uh, choice that you have. You have Democrat or Republican. If uh, Tulsi ran as an independent, I'd support her. Uh, if uh, my old friend Dr. Jill Stein was the Green Party candidate uh, once again, I'd, I'd back her. Uh, but I could never, under any circumstances, support Joe Biden, because I've followed his career for so many decades, almost five decades, and I know him to be responsible for many of the most deep-seated problems in America and a foghorn, never mind a a mouthpiece, a foghorn for war and oppression abroad. So I would love to see uh, Trump uh, team up as a vice president with someone like Rand Paul, who would make sure that he kept his promise to make America great again, focus on America's problems 
and leave the rest of the world alone. That would be the ideal for me, Michelle. Thanks for your kind words and say hi to Canada for me, please. Saad is in Virginia on the U.S. elections. Go ahead, Saad. Um, hey, uh, Mr. Galloway. I uh, wanted to talk about two, uh, two things uh, real quickly. Trump versus Biden and the U.S. expansionism in regards to China. Well, first of all, with Trump versus Biden, um, this is something that one of my elders once told me uh, when I was out, um, out in the public. Um, whether it's Democratic or Democrats or Republicans, when it comes to foreign policies, they are still going to do the same thing. Why? Because these are the policies, foreign policies, that the CIA and Pentagon have already arranged 25, 50 years ahead of time. Now, when it comes to domestic policies like, you know, legalization of marijuana or abortion, yeah, they have two different views you know, and, and have different views in other aspects as well. But they're, they're still going to pursue the same foreign policies that the CIA and Pentagon have already arranged decades ahead of time. Now, the second thing, uh, Mr. Galloway, in regards to, real quick, expansionism in regards to China of the United States, um, you know, because the U.S. has 900 military bases across the world, you know, sooner or later, uh, China's non-intervention policy, they might actually end up having to counter that policy with some similar measures. Otherwise, their, their own pawns in their own backyard of China, if they, if they, if they turn against China, then what, what is China going to do? You know, so, and, you know, uh, on the... Well, I think the that Chinese... Uh, Saad, thanks, uh, thanks for that call. I think the Chinese leadership is very wise and sagacious. I loved to see uh, Xi Jinping scolding uh, little Justin Trudeau like uh, an errant schoolboy today. And I loved how uh, Trudeau uh, her herpled off. He could hardly walk straight after the dressing down that uh, Xi Jinping uh, gave him. I think the Chinese leadership is wise. I don't think they are unaware uh, of the things that you adumbrated. Uh, I'm certain that they are aware of them. But China doesn't want war. It wants to achieve its aim of uh, national reunification uh, with Taiwan peacefully by agreement. But in any case, it is very clear that it is an internal Chinese matter. And by the way, 93% of the Taiwanese agree that it is an internal Chinese matter. Only 7% of the people of Taiwan want a declaration of independence from China. Uh, so uh, China will try to use its great strengths, its economic strength, its uh, cohesiveness strength, uh, the Chinese society compared to American society or increasingly British society is like a model uh, society. It's a society where lawlessness and, and social disintegration and social breakdown and family breakdown and uh, rampant violent crime and so on simply don't exist. The Chinese police don't even have guns. Can you believe that? They don't even carry guns. Uh, so China as a society is overwhelmingly more wholesome and together uh, than American or British society is. So these kind of strengths, uh, social peace, cohesiveness, growing economic strength, and the overwhelming likelihood that China will be the uh, dominant economic uh, force in the world in, within a decade from now, uh, they hope that the American people will uh, force their government to step back from the uh, possibility of military conflict. But China talks uh, softly, walks softly, but it has a big stick. And if it has to, it will use it with devastating effect. And the Americans really need to know that. Thanks, Sad. Kyle is in Los Angeles. Go ahead, Kyle. Hello again, George. Actually, I'm in Topanga, and Topanga Canyon is quite different from Los Angeles. It's uh, a, a very uh, rural kind okay, of Okay, it sounds wonderful. Yeah, it sounds it's a bit wonderful. windy, so I'm afraid that, uh, that it's fire. So I'm scanning the horizon for plumes of smoke, you see. But uh, the only oh thing that scares me... Oh, my goodness. Well, uh, if we hear you that, running, we'll know 
God forbid that that's what's happened. Go, God go forbid, ahead, Cal. But the, on, the only thing that scares me more than fires would be a nuclear war. And I'm afraid that uh, I'm with you 100% when it comes to the conundrum that we face in the United States with regards to the two-party system and the horror of having to regard Trump as a peace candidate. Unfortunately, he is the only person running. Compared to the other guy, he is. I think his, at least his appetites are understandable. They're gross and they're obnoxious, but he just wants to have fun and he just wants to be a businessman and make money. Um, These Democrats scare me much more because they seem to be well, I, I can't understand it, that's all. Uh, they seem to be uh, very interested in flirting with World War III. And so our survival has got to be the most important issue. So I agree with you maybe a thousand percent that uh, at this point, Trump is the, is the best of an extremely poor range of choices. Um, and I, I can't believe that I'm saying well, that. Well, look, Kyle, I would that, never Kyle actually... that's the... Uh... Yeah, that's the call of the night, and we uh, saved it for last. Kyle in Los Angeles summing up uh, in a metaphor uh, exactly where we are. The fires in uh, California are a clear and present danger, but the fires, if they come to the canyon, God forbid, and burn down Kyle's home, we must expect and at least hope that Kyle and his family will escape it. But if the fires of World War III are headed our way, no one, not Kyle, not me, not his children, not mine, not yours, will survive such an outcome. And I need to put this point as firmly as I did the last time I made it to you. Do you really want the world to end over that unpronounceable Polish village and the two unfortunate farm workers that were killed by a Ukrainian missile? Do you really want to take that risk? Does it matter to you whether Kupiansk or Izium is in Russia or in Ukraine? Ukraine has been in three different countries in the last hundred years. Four, actually. Four. If you count the now eastern part of Ukraine, which is back in Russia. If you watch the history of the Romanovs, as I did just last night on The Crown on Netflix. Where did the Queen Mother of Russia live? She lived in Kiev. Kiev was a Russian capital city before St. Petersburg. Never mind before Moscow. Ukraine was Russia. Russia was Ukraine. Parts of the Ukraine have been in Poland. Parts of Ukraine have been in Hungary. Parts of Ukraine have been in Romania. A hundred years ago, France and Britain were occupying precisely the parts of Ukraine, Mariupol, Odessa, that were or still are occupied by Western-backed coup government in Kiev. So you need to ask yourself, do you really want to die? Never mind, do you want to die? I don't care about dying. I've lived a great life. But I have six children, and one of those has five children. That's why I care so much about whether or not Joe Biden starts World War III Not for myself. God could strike me down now. I'd happily meet my maker. But my children and their children as yet unborn are what concerns me. So you need to ask yourself, why are you allowing, as Ben Swan said, your leaders to drag us closer and closer and closer to disaster? Why? Why are you silent about it? Why are you not out agitating about it? Why are you not talking to everyone you can about the terrifying danger 
that faces us. I am, so should you be. I didn't come here to entertain you, though entertaining I hope it was. I didn't just come here to educate you, though educational I hope it was. I came here to agitate you and to help organize you into changing public opinion. Again, as Ben Swan talked about earlier. Because if we don't, we're done for. I truly mean that. If we don't, we're done for. If not now, then not far distant from now. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Ravi and Robert, the cosmetic genius of 220km.inc and the Together phone app, which I'm about to use actually as soon as this show finishes. Together, there it is up on the screen. Without them, there wouldn't have been this show. That's important. Please download Together and go to the website of Ravi and the Cosmetics. Now Foods, you can get two things. Ship free. Shipping free. Well, it's been marvelous uh, for me. I uh, hope it was for you. Hope I didn't get too angry or emotional at the end. I do get emotional when I think how close last night we came. We could have been having a very different discussion here this evening on the eve of destruction. Where are Barry Maguire's when you need them? See you on Sunday, 7 p.m. UK time. God bless you all.